Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Welcome to another episode of The Nuanced. Under this series, we take up some of the most complex topics related to UPSC civil services examination and break it down in order to ensure that your understanding regarding these complex topics is as nuanced as possible. So the topic for today's discussion is the latest clashes that has broken out between Iran and Israel. As you all read in newspapers, the last 48 hours have been quite intense as far as the West Asia region is concerned. Iran fired more than 300 missiles and drones targeted towards Israel, marking one of the biggest escalations as far as West Asia region is concerned. So in this session, we will talk about the context, the series of events that have taken place. But more importantly, we will also explore the brief history of Iran-Israel relationship. We will also talk about the recent events centered around Gaza and the Gaza conflict which is taking place. And we'll explore how these events have destabilized the larger West Asia region. And more importantly, we will talk about the impact of all these events on Indian interests in the region. So if you guys benefit from our sessions, do let us know through your comments, your likes, and without fail, do subscribe to our channel. So first, let's explore the context. And then we have a very important announcement. So a couple of days ago, roughly around 36 to 40 hours ago, Iran launched a deadly strike against Israel involving more than 300 projectiles. A collection of drones, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles were fired from Iran and other countries as well, which are allied with Iran. And these projectiles were headed towards Israel. Now, the reason why this is a very significant development is because this is the first time ever that Iran and Israel are in a direct overt confrontation. These two countries, which have been regional rivals for decades, they have been hostile to each other. They have even engaged in a shadow covert war against each other from several decades. But for the first time, there has been a direct confrontation between Iran and Israel. These missiles, many of them were launched from Iranian soil, targeted towards Israeli territory. So that is the reason why this becomes a significant escalation in West Asia. It has all the potential to escalate further and trigger a much wider regional conflict that could consume not just West, West Asia, but it could consume the whole world as well. So what is very interesting is that if you look at the outcome of these attacks, majority of these projectiles were successfully intercepted by Israel and its Western allies. Almost 99% of the drones and missiles that were launched by Iran, they were successfully intercepted that too even before they entered Israeli territory. So apart from that, if you notice the damage the damage on Israel has been very minimal. Apart from one strike on an Israeli air base, apart from that, there has been no serious damage as such that Israel has suffered. And more importantly, very few people have been injured and there have been no deaths reported by Israel. Now, this leads anyone to conclude that the Iran, Iranian attack on Israel was a failure. Or rather, Israel foiled the attack through its superior air defense. And thanks to the support it received from its allies, it could successfully intercept most of the projectiles, thus foiling the attack. But there are few analysts and experts who are presenting another argument. The question is, did Iran deliberately plan the attack in such a manner that it would not have a significant casualty rate? Was it just a symbolic retaliation by Iran for something that Israel had done earlier? And was the attack designed to fail in order to prevent a wider escalation? So that is what we are going to explore in today's session. And I promise that this would be an interesting discussion. And more importantly, the discussion would be very, very relevant for UPSC civil services examination. The topic is extremely important under GS paper 2 for international relations. Now, before we get into the topic, we have a very big announcement because today was a big day for 2023 civil services aspirants. 
UPSC has declared the final results and more than 1000 candidates have made it to the top list. And we are extremely glad to tell you that a number of toppers are from an academy's program. A total of 315 plus toppers were part of an academy's program in some way or the other. Let me break this, break this down and provide the transparent data as well. Around 66 of the toppers were an academy students in our online off offline classroom program. Around 95 of the students, they were part of our online learning platform and around 150 plus students were part of our interview guidance program. So to those of you who have cracked the exam, a hearty uh, wishes from my side and congratulations and all the very best. But those who haven't cleared the exam, don't get dejected. This is a time to retrospect, to introspect and, and identify the mistakes where you went wrong and come back stronger in the next attempt. And for that, you have to keep your motivation higher. And to help you in this path, we at an academy are always there to, to guide you in your preparation. And just like many of our students have come out in the top, in the top list, many of you could also crack this dream of yours. And on this occasion, we are offering a massive price drop on our IAS courses. And you, if you wish to enroll, you can contact us with by using the number provided below. Right? So with this, let's begin with our discussion. Let's first start with the brief history of Iran-Israel relationship. The question is, were Iran and Israel always rivals? Did they always share a hostile relationship like this? So let's explore that angle for a brief while. Let's also discuss the geopolitical developments that West Asia has witnessed over the past few decades. Because understanding those dynamics is very, very important in order to understand what has transpired in the last couple of weeks. If you look at Iran-Israel relationship, prior to 1979, before 1979, believe it or not, Iran and Israel were very close friends. In fact, Iran was one of the few countries in the region, in the West Asia region, to have recognized Israel, to have established diplomatic relations with Israel, even before other Arab countries. It's quite shocking to believe that because Many of you would know that Iran, Israel today are regional rivals. They have a lot of hostility between them. And for many decades, they have been involved in a covert war against each other. But before 1979, both Iran and Israel were friendly towards each other. And Iran had even recognized Israel's independence as early as late 1950s. Israel had declared unilateral independence in 1948. It had violated the two-state plan of the UN and it had broken international law and it had declared unilateral independence. So as all the other Arab countries, they stood for the rights of Palestinians and attacked Israel, resulting in the first Arab-Israel war. Iran was an exception in the region. Iran stayed away from this conflict. It did not side with the other Islamic nations and Arab countries which were targeting Israel and which were not recognizing Israel even after Israel managed to defeat most of these Arab powers. So Iran recognized Israel after its formation. It went on to set up diplomatic relations and in fact, it even had a strong economic relationship with Israel. Iran was one of the top oil suppliers as well to Israel at that point from 1950s to 1979. But things would change dramatically following the Iranian revolution of 1979. In the year 1979, the then monarch, the Shah of Iran, was overthrown by the protesters, primarily led by the radical Shia clergy in Iran. The Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, from the Pahlavi dynasty, who ruled over Iran from 1950s, was a close ally of US and naturally was aligned with Israel as well. It was widely believed that the United States had installed the Shah of Iran in 1951 by managing a coup. It was alleged that the American intelligence agency, the CIA, had staged a coup in Iran by toppling 
the previous Iranian regime and it had installed the Shah of Iran who was seen as a more progressive, liberal and West-leaning leader. Because remember, this was the era of the Cold War where intense rivalries existed between the Western countries and the communist powers. So, to expand Western influence, it's believed that the US supported the coup attempt which installed the Shah of Iran from the Pehlvi dynasty and as a result, Iran became a Western ally. Again, this might be a, a little shocking for many students because generally you would have read about Iran-US tensions, how US has targeted Iran's nuclear program, how US has imposed sanctions on Iran, how Iran calls for death to America today. But back then, things were very different. There was a pro-US government installed and it was during this period that Iran was friendly towards Israel. The Shah of Iran had reached out to Israel, recognized Israel's independence and had established diplomatic and economic relations as well. But this was disrupted in 1979 following the Iranian revolution. The Iranian revolution was primarily led by the radical Shia clergy. Please remember Iran is a Shia majority country, a major or Shia power in West Asia. So the people of Iran in general, and as well as the conservative radical elements, they were unhappy with the rule of the Shah of Iran. They alleged that the Shah was just a puppet of US, serving Western interests, American and Israeli interests. And following the misgovernance of the Shah of Iran and his authoritarian rule, it led to a rebellion, a violent revolution, through which the people of Iran threw out the Shah's regime. And following this revolution, the Shia clerics took over the country. Iran became a theocratic state. It became a Shia power, adopting conservative religion as its primary political ideology. And the top Shia cleric, the Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khomeini, appointed himself as the supreme leader of Iran. Since then, Iran became a conservative nation. It became the leading Shia power of the region and immediately it led to hostilities with US and as well as with Israel. Iran started promoting a hostile relationship with the Western powers and it would primarily target Israel. Iran would start calling for death to America and death to Israel the new Iranian dispensation would not even recognize the independence of Israel. It would, it would dismiss the legitimacy of Israel and extended complete support for the Palestinian movement, which was raging at that point. So it was from 1979 onwards that Iran became openly hostile to Israel, US and their interests. So as a result, the rivalry began between these two countries. Now, apart from the Iran-Israel angle, you should also understand the larger sectarian divide in West Asia, which defines the geopolitics of West Asia. There has been a major divide in West Asian geopolitics between the Shia powers and the Sunni powers. As Iran rose to prominence and emerged as the leading Shia power, it allied with other Shia-led countries, such as Syria, Lebanon, and even in Iraq, the Shiite population would side with the Iranian regime. On the other hand, the Sunni powers led by Saudi Arabia, along with United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Bahrain, and even Qatar to an extent, along with Oman, all these Sunni Arab states would align together and extend rivalry against the Shia power bloc. The sectarian divide within Islam was now getting reflected in regional geopolitics of West Asia. The Sunni powers were aligned on one side, led by Saudi Arabia as their regional leader, and the Shia powers were led by Iran, triggering intense rivalry and hostilities between the Shia and Sunni powers as well. By then, something interesting had already occurred. Between the Sunni powers and the US, a very close relationship had already developed since the 1970s 
primarily because of the oil crisis. The 1970s oil crisis had pushed the United States into a greater role in West Asian geopolitics. And the US had aligned closely with the authoritarian monarchies of Saudi Arabia, UAE and others. So as the Sunni authoritarian regimes became closer to the US, they would secretly start working with Israel as well. By late 1970s, as Iran became a radical Shia theocracy and became a challenge for the Sunni powers, it further pushed the Sunni powers to align with US and thereby work out a secret arrangement with Israel as well. Even though these Gulf countries and the other Arab nations, they would not recognize Israel and not set up ties with Israel, and they would still, at least for the sake of it, back the Palestinian cause. In reality, Saudi, UAE and others, they silently withdrew the support for the Palestinian movement and started working behind the scenes with Israel and US to counter their new threat, their new enemy, that is Iran. So this created a new axis, a, a division to come up in West Asia. With Iran and the Shia powers on one side, and US, Israel and Saudi Arabia and other Sunni powers on the other side. So this triggered a series of shadow wars between these regional powers. In fact, the dynamics are extremely complex here, but I'll try to break it down as much as is needed for our exams. So as Iran faced a considerable threat from Israel, from US, from the Sunni powers, Iran started engaging in covert proxy wars it would start backing several proxies across the region to target Sunni interests, Iran, Israeli interests and American interests. By now, Iran had declared death to America, death to Israel. It was calling for the wipeout of Israel from the, from the map itself. It was challenging the very existence of Israel. So as Israel started countering Iran, Iran retaliated by backing several proxy outfits which would target Israeli and American interests. So let's get some insight into this because all these developments are connected to what has happened in the last few weeks. So in Iran, after the Shia theocracy was established and the supreme leader, the Ayatollah came to power, a new security force was established called the IRGC, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. It's a paramilitary a force which is separate from the Iranian armed forces. It has its own ground branch, aerial branch and naval branch. It primarily engages in military intelligence operations, subversive operations, etc. And it has an elite unit within the organization called the Quds Force. It's a highly secretive unit within IRGC which specializes in intelligence or covert operations, primarily targeted against Iran's rivals. So IRGC, through the Quds force, spread its influence all across West Asia and started destabilizing the West Asia region by supporting several non-state actors. It would directly sponsor extremist organizations which were engaged in acts of terrorism in order to target Israeli and American interests. Now, please look at the map that I've shared over here. I'll explain which proxy groups have been backed by Iran and you'll get a better understanding regarding Iran's proxy war against Israel. If you look at Lebanon over here, which is another um, Shia dominated country, which is aligned with Iran. So in Lebanon, there is a a radical outfit called Hezbollah. It's an extremist organization designated as a terrorist outfit as well by many countries. Obviously, the Western countries, uh, that is US and European countries, Israel and others, they have designated Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. So Hezbollah, which primarily operates in Lebanon, receives direct support, financial support and weapon support from Iran's IRGC. Is that clear? Then look at Syria. Syria has a larger Sunni population actually, but it is ruled by the Assad family. 
the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad belongs to the Alwite sect, which is a Shia sect. So the ruling authoritarian dictator of Syria and his family, they are Shias essentially and aligned with Iran. So Syria has conveniently allowed Iran to provide support for Hezbollah and other proxies that are backed by Iran. Then if you look at Iraq, Iraq has a mix of Sunni and Shia population and Iran enjoys considerable support and influence in Iraq. So there are factions of Hezbollah operating in Syria and Iraq as well. Like for example, Kataib Hezbollah. It's a faction of Hezbollah operating in Iraq primarily with influence in Syria and it gets direct support from Iran. So this is one deadly organization that Iran has sponsored over the decades, which primarily targets Israel. In fact, in 2006, there was even a major conflict between Israel and Hezbollah in Lebanon, resulting in the Lebanon war. Is that clear? In fact, during this conflict as well, few thousand Indians were stuck in Lebanon and India launched Operation Sukoon to evacuate the Indians and other uh, friendly foreign nationals to bring them back safely during this conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. Apart from Hezbollah, Iran has sponsored few other groups including Palestinian extremist organizations such as Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad which operate primarily in the Gaza Strip. So Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, these Palestinian terror outfits Interestingly, are Sunni organizations essentially. But Iran, despite being a Shia power, has backed these Palestinian outfits as proxies to target Israel. Iran believes it is a commitment to ensure the liberation of Palestine. But these outfits have engaged in acts of terrorism and they are classified as terrorist outfits by several countries. Then recently in Yemen, Iran has backed an extremist outfit called the Houthis. I'm sure all of you would have heard about the Houthis recently, but the Houthis have been operating for many years. Since 2014, Yemen has descended into a civil war, which has been sponsored primarily by Iran, where it has given financial support and direct military and weapon support to the Houthis of Yemen. So these are some of the proxies that Iran has cultivated, that is the IRGC has cultivated, and uses them to target the Sunni powers led by Saudi Arabia and also to target Israeli and American interests in the region. Now, obviously, the other countries are no saints. US, Israel and the Sunni powers don't think uh, they have nothing to do with this. They have equally instigated Iran as well. See, in the world of geopolitics, it's hard to say who's right, who's wrong. It's not a world of uh, zeros and ones, right? It, it's actually a gray area right, largely in geopolitics. So it's not just Iran which is the instigator here. There have been triggers by Israel and US as well, which has pushed Iran to do this. So you need to develop a more holistic, comprehensive understanding. Don't be driven by one-sided narratives, which project one side as the, as the right side and the other side as the wrong side. In the world of geopolitics, there doesn't exist a right or wrong. It's about perspectives, right? So if you look at what Israel and US have done as well, right? It pushes Iran to be aggressive. It pushes Iran to engage in such covert proxy wars. And even these countries have contributed to that. So Hezbollah and its factions have been one of the primary weapons of Iran in the region with the support of the Syrian regime under President Bashar al-Assad, with support in Lebanon and also in Iraq, Iran has successfully used Hezbollah to target Israel repeatedly. So this is one part of the covert war which has been going on for many years. Other than that, Iran started pursuing its own nuclear weapons as a form of insurance against Israel and US. Over the last 30 years, Iran has pursued nuclear weapons in violation of the non-proliferation treaty and according to several reports it, it was in an advanced stage with regard to its nuclear enrichment program 
So Iran's nuclear weapons program obviously is of great concern for Israel, US and as well as the Sunni powers led by Saudi Arabia. Because please keep in mind, none of the Sunni powers, none of the countries in West Asia have nuclear weapons. It is believed Israel might possess nuclear weapons, but it has never acknowledged this publicly. It has never tested nuclear weapons, but it is one of the few countries which has not signed the non-proliferation treaty, just like India and Pakistan. So while Israel is ambiguous about its nuclear weapon status, Iran has secretly pursued a nuclear weapons program to ensure that the nuclear weapons act like an insurance, like a shield for Iran against the threats posed by Israel, US and others. So as a result, US and Israel, along with Saudi Arabia and its partners, they have collectively targeted Iran's nuclear weapons program. Over the last two decades, there have been many incidents of sabotage aimed at destabilizing, destroying Iran's nuclear program. From assassinating Iranian nuclear scientists to even cyber warfare. In 2010, it's believed that US and Israeli intelligence agencies, they developed a cyber weapon, a very advanced computer worm called Stuxnet, which was used to hack into Iranian computers that controlled the nuclear enrichment plants. And apparently, the attackers gained remote access, remote control over the functioning of the enrichment plant and they spun it out of control, leading to the destruction of few nuclear centrifuges in Iran. Other than that, Israel has even conducted several targeted strikes against Iranian nuclear facilities in the past. So Iran feels that US and Israel are constantly targeting the country. It feels a threat from the Sunni powers as well. So apart from these covert wars, where Iranian scientists have been assassinated, where cyber war has been um, deployed, cyber weapons have been deployed to target Iran's nuclear program. Apart from that, US in particular has targeted Iran with crippling economic sanctions. First under President Obama, crippling economic sanctions were imposed, but later these sanctions were revoked following a peace deal between Iran and the P5 plus one countries. Following, following negotiations between the five permanent members of UN Security Council and Germany, plus one refers to Germany. So P5 plus one countries, that is US, UK, France, Russia and China, and plus one is Germany. So following negotiations between these countries and European Union, the Iran nuclear deal had been worked out. Iran had committed to shut down its nuclear weapons program and hand over the enriched weapons grade uranium. And in return, US had agreed to lift the sanctions. For a short while, stability had returned to the region. But President Donald Trump, who took over from President Obama, adopted a completely different approach towards Iran. Under President Trump, US alleged that Iran was still secretly developing nuclear weapons without presenting any evidence to indicate that. Even when its own European partners they verified that Iran was still abiding by the nuclear deal. Donald Trump decided to quit the nuclear deal unilaterally in 2018. So as US withdrew from the nuclear deal, the Trump administration brought back crippling economic sanctions against Iran, which has crippled its economy. It has primarily targeted Iran's oil exports, weapons exports, which are uh, key sources of revenue. This even had an impact on India-Iran relations. Even under President Obama, a lot of pressure had been put on India to cut down oil imports from Iran. Because please know that back then, Iran was the second biggest oil supplier to India. We had major investments in Iranian gas fields and oil fields. So during the Obama administration, the then Manmohan Singh government in India refused to follow the sanctions. India never follows these unilateral sanctions. We ignored them. We bypassed the American sanctions and we continued the oil trade with Iran by making alternate payments, by bypassing the dollar system. But unfortunately, the Modi government was brought under pressure by the Trump administration when sanctions were brought back in 2018. The Indian government fell under American pressure and as a result, we were forced to follow the sanctions and we zeroed out the oil imports from Iran. We cut off oil imports from Iran and today we barely have an economic relationship that exists. 
So these American sanctions did hurt India, Iran uh, energy trade. And you can understand by this what has been the impact of these sanctions on Iranian economy. So Iran feels crippled by these sanctions and that is also a reason why Iran tends to react more aggressively against US and its allies in the region. So during these events which were taking place, there was something else that started happening. By 2010-2011, a pro-democracy revolutionary movement broke out in this region which is called the Arab Spring Movement across the MENA region that is Middle East, North Africa region, a wave of pro-democracy protests started spreading, primarily powered through social media. It started in a North African country called Tunisia, right, where the people, they started uh, rebelling against authoritarian dictators. And they started organizing these protests, primarily through Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, and other uh, new social media platforms that had just emerged in 2010-2011. So this was a successful revolution in Tunisia. The dictator was thrown out. So from there, the movement spread to other authoritarian regimes across Middle East, North Africa. It spread to Egypt, where Hosni Mubarak was thrown out. It spread to Libya, where Gaddafi was thrown out, later assassinated as well. And very quickly, this movement was hijacked by the regional and external powers. The regional powers led by Iran, Saudi Arabia, even Israel, then Qatar and Turkey, and US, Russia, China, and Europe, they would all exploit the Arab Spring for their own convenience. They would deliberately sponsor these rebellions and so-called revolutionary movements. And one such rebellion movement was sponsored in Syria as well, which triggered the Syrian civil war in 2011. This was largely engineered, it was largely manufactured from the outside. Of course, Syrian leader Assad was a dictator from the Alawite sect, uh, which is part of the Shia sect, right, ruling over largely a Sunni population, known for his authoritarian policies, but still Syria was a stable country, a flourishing country. But as Syria was an ally of Iran, and as Syria was a prominent base for Hezbollah, The rivals of Iran, led by US, Israel and Saudi Arabia, they hijacked the Arab Spring momentum, which was spreading across the region and started backing a rebellion against the Assad regime. For this purpose, they would even align with radical forces, including the branch of Al-Qaeda called the Al-Nusra Front. Now look at the hypocrisy behind this. At the same time, in 2011, don't forget that US was fighting Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and in other parts of the world. But in Syria, to achieve its own self-interest, it aligned and backed a branch of Al-Qaeda called Al-Nusra Front, which was opposed to the Syrian regime. So these events is what pushed Syria into a, a state of civil war and completely destabilized the country. Various powers were playing their own games. Qatar in particular, even though it's a very small uh, Sunni state, it was punching above its weight. Qatar would, in a way, align with both the sides. It would neither be entirely on the side of the Sunni powers nor on the side of the Shia powers. It has been known to engage with Hamas. Even today, with regard to the ongoing uh, Gaza conflict, Hamas leadership, you might have read in newspapers, is based out of Qatar. The Taliban leadership, which negotiated with the US and worked out a peace deal, was based out of Qatar. So Qatar started playing a critical role. It was even working with other radical groups like Muslim Brotherhood from Egypt and, and other nearby countries. So this led to a rift within the Sunni powers as well. In fact, divisions came up between Saudi Arabia and other GCC countries, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries and Qatar. This rivalry was threatening the relationship between these powers. So that was the situation in the West Asia region and it would get complicated over the years. Just give me a second.
Apologies for the technical inconvenience. Let's resume the discussion. So essentially, US, Israel and Saudi Arabia would deliberately sponsor the civil war in Syria to weaken Iranian influence and interests as Syria and Assad's government was aligned with Iran. And as a result, the rivalries increased and it pushed Iran to retaliate by sponsoring the civil war in Yemen a couple of years later. In 2014, Iran sponsored the Houthis as Yemen was very closely aligned with Saudi Arabia. So given what Saudi, Israel, US were doing in Syria and in the nearby region, which was threatening Iranian influence and interests, Iran countered this by sponsoring a civil war in Yemen. That's why I told you no country is less. No country is a saint here. Everyone has been involved in this covert conflict. So Iran's support to the Houthis is what destabilized Yemen, triggering a massive crisis in Yemen. The Yemeni government was pro-Saudi Arabia. It was pro-Sunni powers. But Iran extended its influence, weakened the country, destabilized the country. So even in Yemen, thousands of Indians were stuck when the civil war broke out in 2014, led by the Houthis. And India had to carry out Operation Rahat to evacuate the Indian nationals from the country. So this has been part of the ongoing proxy wars in the region. And Iran hasn't stopped at this. In fact, Iran's biggest interest is to continue its support for Hamas and other Palestinian terror groups in the name of supporting the Palestinian cause. See, Iran's true interest is not in securing the independence of Palestine or the rights of Palestinians. Of course, Israel has never allowed Palestine to be formed as an independent sovereign nation. It has snatched away the rights of Palestinians. Right? It is an occupation, illegal occupation of Palestinian territory as well. This is widely acknowledged around the world, including by India. But Iran's true interest here is to use these Palestinian extremist groups to target Israel and, and weaken Israel's interest and influence. So Hamas, which rose to prominence in the late 1980s in the Gaza Strip, has received constant support from Iran. So Hamas is again a major proxy of Iran, just like Hezbollah and its factions, just like the Houthis and even the Islamic Jihad, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They've all received enormous funding, weapons and support from Iran as part of its proxy war against Israel. So over the decades, Hamas has carried out many attacks against Israel. It has led to a deadly retaliation by Israel, which often results in these uh, conflicts where Israel is accused of using disproportionate force which leads to the killing of innocent Palestinians as well. But last year, something horrific took place on October 7th, 2023. Hamas, which is backed by Iran, it carried out one of the biggest attacks of its kind. Hundreds of Hamas, Hamas terrorists infiltrated into Israel, crossed over the, the fenced border and carried out brutal attacks across Israeli cities and towns. More than 1,200, 1,300 Israeli civilians were killed and slaughtered. And this was recognized as a, a brutal act of terrorism by most countries, including by India. India stood with Israel. India condemned the act of terrorism. But what's interesting is that India itself has never recognized Hamas as a terrorist organization. Because many countries which which support the Palestinian cause, they look at Hamas as a liberation organization, as a revolutionary outfit. So India has to balance out these conflicting powers and interests in West Asia. So while we condemn the act as an act of terrorism, and we supported Israel in its right to defend itself against terrorism, India never has called Hamas directly as a terrorist organization. We have not officially designated Hamas as a terrorist outfit as well. But following this attack, the October 7th attack, Israel decided to retaliate and as always it used disproportionate force triggering the Gaza war. Gaza is considered as the world's largest open-air prison as 2.5 million Palestinians are trapped and blockaded in the small piece of land by Israel for many years. So in the name of targeting Hamas, Israel has unleashed a brutal war in Gaza and as well as in West Bank leading to the killing of thousands of Palestinian civilians as well. So over the last few months, 
that is over the last seven to eight months, Israel is responsible for the killing of more than 33 to 35,000 Palestinian civilians. According to verifiable data from several global institutions that work in the field of human rights, Israel's war in Gaza has already cost anywhere between 33 to 35,000 lives, many of whom are innocent Palestinian civilians. Of course, Israel has every right to ha act against Hamas, target Hamas. But in the name of targeting a terrorist group, you can't go on committing a slaughter of civilians. Israel has blocked the delivery of aid material as well. It has continued its blockade of Gaza and even prevented the materials from reaching the population, be it food, medicines, even water. And this has triggered a massive humanitarian crisis in Gaza and it has even led to allegations by certain countries that Israel is committing a genocide against Palestinians. South Africa, for example, has filed a case of genocide against Israel at the International Court of Justice. Brazil and many other countries have supported this and the case is ongoing at the ICJ. So as Israel faces a lot of criticism for the ongoing Gaza conflict, Iran has continued and escalated its covert proxy war against Israel. Since October 7th, following the terror attack by Hamas, after Israel declared the war and invaded Gaza, since then, Iran also has scaled up its sponsorship of various proxies. It has reactivated all the proxy groups and it has been using them to target Israeli and American interests. Now, this is what brings us to the current situation. So over the last few months, Hezbollah, which is sponsored by Iran, has launched several attacks from Lebanon towards northern Israel. The Houthis of Yemen also have been activated by Iran. And for the first time, the Houthis started firing missiles and drones targeting Israel and even Israeli ships and Western linked commercial ships passing through the vital Red Sea route. The Red Sea shipping route is absolutely critical for the global economy. Even India is very dependent on it. It's a vital link that connects Bab al Mandeb Strait over here, which is a choke point, with Gulf of Aden and the Arabian Sea. This is a vital shipping route that will link with the Suez Canal in Egypt and the Mediterranean Sea that connects Europe with Indian Ocean. So this vital shipping route, which is crucial for energy supplies as well, has been completely disrupted by the attacks carried out by Houthis. So Houthis have said that these attacks are in, are in response to what Israel ha has done against Palestinians. It is a, a, a show of solidarity with the Palestinians. And Iran has activated its proxy here in Yemen and it has been targeting commercial ships and it has even fired missiles and drones towards Israeli territory. So here, US and few other countries have been targeting the Houthis. The US, which has been protecting Israeli interests and backing Israel in the war, is, it has not only supplied uh, weapons and provided financial support, but it has even directly intervened in the Red Sea. The US Armed Forces, the US Navy and Air Force have been playing a, a direct role in the conflict here where they have targeted Houthi bases and they have intercepted several uh, missiles fired by Houthis in the last few months. So this has already disrupted the shipping channel and it has pushed some of the ships to take a longer route around Africa, around the Cape of Good Hope. So this already has had an economic cost on the global economy. It has affected uh, Indian interests as well because India relies on the shipping channel. So the Hez Hezbollah, which operates from Lebanon, has escalated its cross-border attacks in solidarity with uh, the people of Gaza, right, with Palestinians. Hezbollah has been used by Iran and Iran has been arming these outfits through Syria and Iraq. So the IRGC, the Quds Force, they have been arming these proxies and using them to target Israel and this always posed the risk of a wider escalation. Everyone was worried that this direct war in Gaza led by Israel and the covert proxy war sponsored by Iran could escalate any time. It could blow out into a, a bigger a conflict which could consume the whole region.
That was the fear that every country, every analyst had since October 7th. And now those fears are coming true. Since Iran kept sponsoring these proxies, that is IRGC, it covertly st kept supporting these proxies through Syria and Iraq. So this is where some of Iranian intelligence operations were being run through IRGC and the Quds Force. So Israel decided to retaliate against this a couple of weeks ago. On the 1st of April, at the start of this month, allegedly there was an airstrike against the Iranian diplomatic mission in Damascus. Damascus is the capital of Syria. So at the Iranian embassy, only the consular section, where the consulate of Iran is located within the uh, embassy premises, was targeted with a devastating airstrike, following which top Iranian officials were killed, including a senior commander of IRGC. So Iran has blamed this airstrike on Israel. It's alleged that Israel is the one which conducted this airstrike. Israel has neither confirmed it nor denied it. Israel has not given any confirmation or denial whether it was involved in this airstrike. But it's anyone's guess that this airstrike obviously would have been carried out by Israel because Israel would be looking to target IRGC's covert operations being run through Iraq and Syria where they were giving support to Hezbollah and other proxies targeting Israel. Is that clear? In fact, at the start of the Gaza war, Kateb Hezbollah, which operates in Iraq, had fired few missiles towards uh, Israel and other countries. These missiles were intercepted by US and US targeted Kateb Hezbollah in Iraq. So Israel was waiting for an opportunity to hit back at Iran's proxy war. And on the 1st of April, two weeks ago, it has reportedly, allegedly carried out an airstrike against Iranian diplomatic mission. Now, this marks the biggest escalation from Israel. If you ask me how this is different, this is very, very different because for the first time, two state actors were directly involved in a confrontation, involved in an attack. See, until then, Iran, Israel were always involved in just a proxy war. But now, Israel allegedly had carried out a strike against an Iranian diplomatic mission killing its officials. So obviously, Iran would treat this as an act of war. Iran would reserve the right to retaliate as well. right? And if there is no retaliation from Iran, it would weaken Iran's power status. If Iran doesn't avenge these Israeli attacks, alleged Israeli attacks against its consulate, right? Iran would be undermined. Iran would be seen as a weaker power which doesn't do anything even when it's uh, diplomatic premises are targeted, even when its officials are killed. So as a result, Iran vowed to take revenge against Israel. Iran treated this as an act of war and over the last two weeks, it kept saying that it will extract a price from Israel. It would retaliate in a, in a large scale manner. So around the world, panic started setting in, especially across West Asia. Every government was worried, including India, US, European countries, they were all worried because there were alarming reports coming from the region, particularly regarding Iran's preparation for a major strike against Israel, a retaliatory strike. So in a way, the initial trigger was from Israel. But the reason why Israel would have attacked the Iranian diplomatic mission is because IRGC was directly sponsoring these proxies through its diplomatic missions present in these countries. So that is the complex covert war which has been going on between these powers. And now this has spilled out into the open, resulting in a direct frontal war between the two countries. So Iran, which had sworn to take revenge, it delivered its promise, right? By then, US and every other country had warned that Iran is just hours away from launching a major strike. And as anticipated, Iran fired multiple projectiles, hundreds of missiles, ballistic and cruise missiles, hundreds of drones. So in total, more than 300 projectiles were launched, not just from Iran, but from other countries as well. From Syria, from Iraq, even from Lebanon, where Hezbollah operates. Hezbollah launched several rockets and missiles in the days preceding the attack. 
In fact, prior to this direct war between Iran and Israel, Iran even seized a ship near the Hormuz Strait. The Hormuz Strait is also very critical for oil supplies. It's another choke point that connects the Gulf of Oman with Persian Gulf. So there were fears that Iran might blockade the Hormuz Strait, which could destabilize the oil markets. But fortunately, it hasn't done that as of now. It only seized a ship linked with Israel. But unfortunately, there is an Indian connection everywhere. Today, Indian workers are spread out so much in every part of the world that any such adverse development, India stands to get affected. 17 of the crew members of this ship captured by Iran, they are Indian nationals. Right, right now, India is negotiating with Iran to secure their safe release and to bring them back to India. So apart from seizing a ship and pushing Hezbollah to launch attacks from Lebanon, Iran went to a direct assault by launching hundreds of projectiles towards Israel from Iraq, from Syria, even from Yemen. Houthis fired few projectiles towards Israel, but the primary attack came from Iran. So that is why this event is different from what has happened earlier. In the past, we have seen such proxy wars where, for example, the Houthis have been firing missiles and drones uh, in the past few months. So what is different right now is that this is a direct war between the state of Iran and the state of Israel. The two state actors were directly involved in this conflict. This is the first time ever that Iran has used its own territory to launch a direct attack against Israeli territory. It has never happened in the past. So that is why this is unprecedented. It has every potential to escalate from here on and it could break out into a larger conflict as well. But the question is, is it possible? Is a wider escalation a reality or is it really possible? Because as I told you, most of these projectiles were intercepted. This is data given by Israeli Defense Forces. I have taken this from IDF's official social media accounts. The IDF stated that more than 300 projectiles were fired in total, but 99% of them were intercepted. Out of the 170 plus Shaheed drones, these are Iranian drones which are armed with explosives that were fired, not a single drone reached Israeli territory. They were all intercepted and shot down even before it could reach Israel. Out of the 120 ballistic missiles that were launched, all of them were launched from Iran, by the way. Most of them were intercepted, some of them outside the atmosphere as well, as ballistic missiles take a, a parabolic path, right? They cross over into outer space and then uh, make a re-entry to strike the target. So Israel's superior air defense, with the support it has got from its allies, it has managed to intercept most of them with only few ballistic missiles hitting Israel. Then coming to cruise missiles, most of them were intercepted. Not a single cruise missile entered uh, Israeli territory. They were, all, they were all shot down by Israel and its allies even before it could reach Israel. So who were the allies who were helping Israel here? When the attack started, right, this attack went on for a good five hours. It was a moment of chaos for the whole region. Because in between Iran and Israel, as you saw in the map, there are several other countries located. You have Jordan, you have Iraq. A good thousand kilometer distance lies between them. So any missile or drone launched or fired from Iran will take few hours, a good three to four hours to reach Israel. So essentially through the night, these projectiles were streaking through the skies of Jordan, Iraq and other countries, triggering panic. And these videos were circulated on social media, causing global alarm. But Israel got tremendous support from its allies, US, UK and even Jordan. US, of course, stood in support for Israel as it was very evident that Iran is going to retaliate and the attack was imminent. US had deployed additional forces in the region and US Navy and Air Force have directly shot down some of the missiles and drones. Same with UK and even France, both were involved in direct operations along with Israeli forces. But Jordan, which often supports the Palestinian cause but has a, a relationship with Israel, has protected its own airspace because most of the missiles and drones were threatening Jordan itself because some of them could have landed in Jordan and they did. According to reports, a few Jordanians might have been injured or killed according to certain reports. 
So Jordanian airspace was completely closed and Jordan's air force also intercepted and shot down several missiles and drones. So eventually, the conclusion, what does it lead us to conclude? The conclusion is that the attack was largely a failure for all the hype and for all the spectacle. Eventually, the attack was a failure, right? No significant damage was caused. Majority of the missiles didn't even reach Israel. They were already shot down. Very few landed in Israeli territory causing minimal damage. Just a few injuries, no casualties reported by Israel as of now. Maybe some casualties in Jordan, right? But nothing else was achieved from this. So this gives rise to a very interesting theory and a question that did Iran deliberately design the attack to fail? Now, some of you might be wondering, what's the reason? What's the purpose behind that? What's the point in launching so many missiles and drones if you don't intend to cause harm to the enemy, right? The point is, this could be just a show of strength. It could just be a symbolic attack. Now, you might ask me, on what basis am I saying this? See, there is a basis for this. Four years ago, there was a very similar incident between Iran and US. In 2020, a similar confrontation took place between Iran and US. US had killed a top Iranian general, Qasem Soleimani, who was the head of the Kurds force. He was working in Iraq, guiding Iran's covert operations, and he was targeted in an American drone strike. The US eliminated a top Iranian general. Imagine the head of the Quds force, a top general within the IRGC. So obviously, Iran took this attack very personally and swore to retaliate and take revenge for the killing of Qasem Soleimani. But what Iran did was very interesting. Iran did retaliate. It did fire several missiles against American targets. American military bases in Iraq was targeted with several missiles and drones. And what is interesting is that there was not a single casualty on the American side. Right? Of course, some were intercepted by American air defense in Iraq. But it gave rise to a theory that Iran didn't want an escalation. Right? It didn't want casualties on the American side, which might push the Americans to counter that, which could further escalate into a bigger war. So Iran just wanted to send out a symbolic message, a show of strength, that if you mess with us, we will mess back with you. We will retaliate against you. So advance notice had been given. Essentially, Iran kept announcing that we will extract blood. We will take revenge against US for the killing. Right now, nobody gives notice. Nobody tells that we are going to attack the other country. Right in any such attack, what is really significant is the element of surprise. If you take uh, a similar instance between India Pakistan that occurred recently in 2019, following the Pulwama terror attacks, right, India had decided to retaliate. Right, we had decided to target the terror bases in Pakistan. But India didn't announce this. We didn't say we will uh, take revenge for Pulwama attacks or we didn't, kept, uh, we didn't keep on announcing for days together that there would be a retaliation from India. Right? Indian Air Force discreetly sneaked into Pakistani airspace, carried out Balkot airstrikes and only then India took credit for it. India acknowledged that we had breached Pakistani uh, airspace and we carried out this airstrike. The element of surprise is crucial in any such operations. But here Iran had given the Americans sufficient notice Plus, any such slow-moving missiles will take time. They'll take several minutes to hours to reach the target, which is sufficient time to detect and intercept. So, in case of the 2020 incident, where Iran, so, uh, in a so-called way, took revenge for killing of Qasem Soleimani, there was not a single American casualty. No injuries were reported as well at the American military base in Iraq. So, what's the whole purpose? What's the whole point? The analysis is that Iran was simply sending a message to the US. It didn't want escalation. Iran's economy is also already crippled. It, it doesn't want a full-fledged war, right? So just to show that there will be a prize for what US had done, it had launched these strikes with no American casualties. And maybe there could have even been back-channel communication that, see, we are looking at retaliation to show the world that we don't take this lightly, but we don't intend to escalate. We just want to show a retaliation, a, a, a show of strength, and possibly the intention should have been, could have been to avoid any American casualties. Something similar might have happened here. That's what a few analysts are pointing out. 
right? Iran is not stupid enough to launch hundreds of missiles and drones and just lose them. Is that clear? Iran, of course, would know that Israel has superior air defense. In fact, many of them have a wrong uh, misconception that Israel's air defense is all about Iron Dome because that is the most popular. But however, in this recent incident, it's not Iron Dome alone which played a big role because Iron Dome is designed for short range uh, missiles and rockets. All right. But what Israel was actually dealing with here were ballistic missiles, cruise missiles and, and drones. So that is where Israel's multi-tiered air defense came into picture. Israel has a, a very sophisticated multi-tiered air defense uh, system. It has not just the Iron Dome for short range missiles and rockets. It also has the Arrow system. Arrow 2 and 3. They are designed for long range interception of even ballistic missiles. They can intercept ballistic missiles in the outside of the Earth's atmosphere as well. It also has something called the David's Sling, which is another air defense platform along with the spider system, which can carry out interception in the medium range. So Israel has created a very sophisticated multi-tiered uh, air defense system, which took down these missiles, drones and uh, cruise missiles. Israeli Air Force shot down several of these projectiles as well. So it's not just Iron Dome. Don't be under the misconception. Because generally you would have seen only the Gaza conflict, you would have read about Hamas firing rockets into Israel and Iron Dome uh, kicking into action, intercepting all these rockets. Iron Dome is effective only for short range missiles and rockets. To deal with uh, even drones or ballistic missiles especially, you would need advanced air defense systems which Israel has put in place. So along with that, the help it got from other countries is what helped Israel to deter the attack. So now coming to the final point. What did Iran really achieve by launching this attack? If it was just a symbolic strike, if it was probably designed to fail, right? So possibly Iran wanted to send out a message to Israel that such attacks will not be tolerated. The alleged Israeli airstrike on uh, Iranian diplomatic mission, right? That is what caused the trigger for Iran. So if you look at the damage that Israel has suffered from these attacks, it's very interesting to note that only the Nevatim Air Base has suffered some damage. Because according to reports, it is from this air base, the aircrafts took off, which carried out the airstrikes in Damascus. The Iranian consulate, which was hit allegedly by Israeli aircraft, reportedly they took off from the Nevatim Air Base located here near West Bank. That is the only military site that Iran has targeted where some damage has been reported to Israel's military infrastructure. Other than that, most of the missiles which entered, they have landed in no man's land in occupied West Bank. There have been few injuries, but no deaths. So that is where the question comes up. Was Iran mindful of the way in which it was carrying out the attack? Iran would know, obviously, there would be several hours of prior notice. It had already warned all the other countries that it would take revenge. From two weeks, it kept saying that. It had seized the ship. Hezbollah had already fired rockets. So what's the point of launching 300 missiles and rockets again? The most likely conclusion is that the attack was designed to fail because Iran also doesn't want an escalation. Right? Because now, Israel is facing a dilemma. Should Israel retaliate against what has happened or should it show restraint? So given what Iran has done, and since the damage is quite minimal, most likely, most likely Israel is not going to respond. Understood? Now, for example, I'll draw a parallel again with Balkot airstrikes here to help you understand how rational actors behave in geopolitics. When you're dealing with two rational state actors, it's important to understand how decision making is carried out. See, after Pulwama attacks, there was outrage in India, right? And India carried out a surprise airstrike, the Balkot airstrikes. Then what happened? The Pakistani Air Force, I'm sure all of you remember, breached Indian airspace as a show of retaliation against India. The very next day after Balkot airstrikes, after Indian Air Force had uh, breached Pakistani uh, airspace and sovereignty, the very next day Pakistani jets entered Indian territory trying to bomb few targets in India. It even led to an aerial dogfight between Indian Air Force and Pakistani Air Force, right? Both sides, they shot down one jet of each other. Unfortunately, the Indian pilot landed um, in 
Pakistan occupied Kashmir and later was handed over to India. But if you remember those events, India made it very clear, publicly India said that this is the end of our retaliation. We are stopping at this. Our goal was to target the terror camps of Jaisha Muhammad at Balkot, which was responsible for Pulwama. Since we have achieved that goal, we are not seeking any escalation. This was a public stand taken by the Modi government. It was a message to Pakistan that we are not going to escalate. We don't want a full-fledged war. Now, Pakistan obviously can't sit idle. Otherwise, it will be ridiculed within the country. Its people will question the Pakistani armed forces. Pakistan's power status will be affected at the global level. That any country can attack Pakistan and Pakistan would do nothing. So just to show a symbolic show of strength that it is going to retaliate. It breached Indian airspace. It led to one, one minor skirmish and things ended at that. Pakistan also de-escalated. India also de-escalated. Because that is what rational actors do in geopolitics. They have to send out a message for their domestic audience, for the global community. That is why they engage in some minor escalations. But none of them would actually seek a major escalation that could lead to a bigger war. So now, given what Iran has done, it appears that it was largely designed to fail just to show a, a symbol of strength, to show that Iran is retaliating against Israel. And Iran has also stated that this is the end of our retaliation. It has publicly stated that our retaliation against Israel has ended, which means Iran is not seeking an escalation. That is a message to Israel. So now it's up to Israel how it's going to respond. Israel's war cabinet has met multiple times in the last 30 hours. And there are reports that Israel might show some kind of retaliation. Because since Iran carried out a major uh, escalation, Israel also can't take it lying down. Either it might show complete restraint because there is pressure from US as well. Because US has said it will not be involved in any kind of military retaliation against Iran. See, US defending Israel is a different thing altogether. Shooting down Iranian missiles and drones is a different thing altogether. But US, if it were to militarily intervene against Iran, that would be a conflict between US and Iran. That is something US would like to avoid. So US has made it very clear that it's not going to be part of any military retaliation against Iran. Maybe diplomatic retaliation. Maybe increased sanctions. Maybe some action through UN Security Council. But nothing beyond that. But Israel is considering its options. Because again, Israel can't be seen as a weaker power as well. Plus, on one side, it's already dragged with Gaza war against Hamas. Dealing with Hezbollah and other proxies. Now, does really Israel have the strength to fight a full-fledged war with Iran? That is a big question. So either Israel will show restraint as a rational actor and end things as it is, or Israel may also retaliate, but in a limited manner. Just to show to Iran that Israel will also not sit idle in case of such escalations. But the problem is, you never know how these things will pan out. Easily, there could be miscalculations, miscommunication, wrong assumptions, and things could go out of hand very quickly. As of now, we are dealing with two rational states who understand the consequences of a bigger escalation. So one is hoping that things will end over here. Maybe there might be some kind of retaliation. Maybe Israel could step up its covert war. Israel might further target Iran's nuclear program, right? Or Israel could target the proxies of Iran. Right? That is something which will keep the conflict within control. But a direct attack by Israel again against Iran could, things, could easily uh, spin things out of control. So that is something we are hoping uh, it, it won't happen. Now, coming to my last point, what, what is in it for India? What are the concerns of India? Because the moment the escalation started, India started making statements. On 1st April, when the Iranian mission was targeted by airstrikes in uh, Damascus, India issued a statement calling for restraint on both sides. When Iran alleged that Israel was the one ca which carried out the airstrikes, Iran urged both the countries to remain calm and to de-escalate and to show restraint. India issued an advisory as the tensions were building up. We issued an advisory to Indian nationals in Iran and Israel to, to stay safe and to not uh, you know, be in the line of uh, fire if something were to escalate. So India's bigger concern here is about the stability of West Asia. West Asia is our extended neighborhood. India was already uncomfortable with the Gaza war. 
the gaza war has had deadly consequences for shipping through red sea it has threatened movement of ships through choke points like babel mandeb and hormuz strait now the last thing thing we want is a full blown out war between iran and israel because both the countries are very important partners for india india won't be able to choose between either of them we have important strategic relations security relations and economic relations with both of them israel is a key defense and strategic partner major supplier of weapons to india right from kargil war till now it has been a key supplier of arms and weapons we have strong intelligence relations right we have very good economic ties as well same with iran iran even though we have cut down our economic ties and zeroed out oil imports it is still a strategic partner for india be it accessing central asia and afghanistan is concerned through the chabahar port which india has built right so connectivity is one reason why iran is critical strategic for us without the chabahar port built by india and operated by indian company we won't be able to access afghanistan and central asia which are rich in resources iran is concerned about the taliban regime in afghanistan iran is concerned about the presence of terrorism in the afghanistan pakistan belt so iran is a a good ally for india to counter terrorism that emanates from the afpak region and also to counter any threats emanating from taliban ruled afghanistan particularly the islamic state isis khorasan has become a threat in afghanistan it threatens indian interests iranian interests so we need iran support to counter terrorism in the region we need iran support to access chabahar port and afghanistan and central asia so there are many key projects which india and iran are part of and if things normalize we would like to resume oil trade and gas trade from iran iran can be a, a big energy supplier it was the second top supplier to india at one point so it's very difficult for india to choose between either of them if a war breaks out and that is a worst case scenario for india so that is why india is urging restraint on both the sides and more importantly we have direct interests any further conflict here will destabilize the the trading routes and shipping routes that could disrupt energy supplies unfortunately we are heavily dependent on oil imports almost 85% of our oil supplies comes comes from abroad most of it 60% of it passes through these two choke points from babel mandeb to hormuz strait so we can't afford any further conflict as it could disrupt oil supplies and destabilize the indian economy and more importantly there are indian lives at stake in iran there are few thousand indians in israel we had few thousand indians working as caregivers before the war but most of them have returned but what is ironic is recently we signed a deal a labor deal with israel where india has promised to send 40000 construction workers because in israel most construction workers were palestinians from west bank so since the war started the gaza war these palestinians have been blocked from israel they have not been uh, employed israel is not employing them uh and as a result it's facing a shortage of uh, workers in the construction sector so israel is looking to india to send cheap construction labor we signed a deal recently we even sent first the first batch of indian uh, workers to israel so now india is worried if things escalate indian workers will be at risk then we'll be forced to evacuate them as well so ensuring the safety of indian workers across the region not just in iran and israel but across the region is of great importance because we have more than 10 million indians more than 1 crore indians are found across west asia north africa region right they are all residing here working here sending remittances back to india they are acting as our cultural ambassadors in these countries so india would definitely be concerned about the safety the well being of the diaspora so we can't afford any further escalation of the conflict because there are direct stakes involved for india right so that is why the topic is very important even for our exams it don't think it's some extra regional development it is a development connected to indian interest directly we have a stand on this issue that is why the topic becomes so important so in this session we have addressed all these issues and and concerns along with exploring the background to this topic so i hope you guys have understood everything and if you like the session do let me know in the comments do let me know what you think about this conflict will it escalate further will israel retaliate what are iran's options right or can you think of any other impact on india 
right? In any other manner, will this development affect India? And what should be India's position? Do let me know in the comments. And that is it for today. If you like the session, please press the like button, subscribe to our channel, and we'll come back with such interesting sessions in the future as well. So that is it for today. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.